We welcome everyone um, to our program for May um, uh, Historical Preservation Month in Wisconsin and the country. Um, today, we're going to have members of the Belgian Heritage Center tell, tell us about the schoolhouse in Namur that they're going to restore to its condition in 1900 or so. Um, so let's get started. Um, without further ado, Anne Jenkins. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. And I also would like to welcome all the participants today. And uh, thank you for um, attending and um, wanting to learn a little bit about the Heritage Center, the Belgian Heritage Center, and our um, current project that we have going. I'm going to, um, well, first I'm going to introduce the um, speakers today. We have Joe Alexander, and he is a co-president of the Belgian Heritage Center. Sandy Orsted is our treasurer, and my name is Ann Jenkins, and I am the secretary. And I'm going to tell a little bit just about the Heritage Center in general and our history, and then the others are going to go into more detail on our, on our project. So um, the Heritage Center was established in 2010 at the former St. Mary's St. Mary of the Snows campus. Lo it's located in the heart of the Namur National Landmark Historic District in Southern Door County. If any of you are unfamiliar with where Namur is, it is north of Dykesville and south of Brussels, Wisconsin. It was the first rural community in the US to achieve this designation. And that was um, primarily because of the prevalence of historic homes, farms, and roadside chapels. The roadside chapels represent a tradition that the settlers brought with them from Belgium. And I'm gonna read our mission, it's up there, um, to preserve and share the history and legacy of the immigrants of the Belgian settlement area through programs and exhibits on the campus of the Belgian Heritage Center. And secondly, the other part of it is by facilitating the efforts of others to preserve and share Belgian heritage for future generations. And here you see a map of um, the settlement area in Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, it stretches roughly from Green Bay in the south to Little Sturgeon in the north and Maplewood and Forestville you see here in the east. It encompasses parts of Brown, Kiwani and Door counties. The orange color represents the highest concentration of where the Belgians settled. And that small square, that small yellow square is the designated Namur National Landmark District. The first immigrants settled near Champion, which I'm not sure if you're seeing my mouse, but it's down here, um, in 1853. And that is known as A Premier Belge, the first Belgians. And why did they come? There, was poor, there were poor economic conditions in Belgium and after Wisconsin became a state in 1848, um, the state offered cheap land to farm and advertised that fact in Europe. So the Belgians came to purchase land that they in turn could pass down to their children. They estimate that 15,000 Bel Belgians settled between 1853 and 1859, and they named their communities using Belgian village names. We have Champion and um, Duval and Lincoln was one time known as Grand Lay. We have Rosaire and Namur and of course Brussels. Um, it's considered the largest Walloon Belgian settlement in the US. And you might, uh, you might ask what is a Walloon Belgian? Well, this refers to the language that they spoke in the region of Wallonia in Belgium. There were also Belgians that came here from the Flemish speaking regions of Belgium, but not in as high number as the Walloons. Our preservation mission, um, of course, all aspects of local Belgian history. We hold cultural events such as our annual Kermis, which is a harvest celebration. Traditionally Kermises would be held in the, in the Belgian communities on consecutive weekends starting in mid-August and going all the way into October. Um, traditional foods are featured at our events and in exhibits. 
These foods include trip, bouillie, jut, and of course, lots of Belgian pies. Um, as an aside, I always like to mention that trip is not tripe. There's some confusion about that. It's, um, it's actually a bratwurst style sausage made with cabbage and Belgian spices. We aim to facilitate the preservation of historic buildings um, throughout the settlement, such as the brick farmhouses, roadside chapels, summer kitchens, and all the original structures. There are many log buildings still standing in the settlement and area, and we hope that there will be for many more years. Walloon language. Walloon is a Romance language with many similarities to French. However, the number of speakers is declining both in Belgium as well as in Northeastern Wisconsin. Um, almost 170 years since the first Belgians arrived here, there are still a few folks who can comfortably speak the language. The center has several video recordings of Belgian descendants telling stories both in English and Walloon. And people are often delighted to be able to come into the center and hear the language, hear how it sounded, and oftentimes they remember their like grandparents speaking, speaking Walloon. And of course, we also want to foster family and community ties. The St. Mary of the Snows campus was first established in 1860. The current brick church, which is the one you see in this picture is the third church on the property. It was built in 1893. The first one was a log church. And then there was a bigger church built that burned down just before this, this one was built in 1892. The school convent came along in 1894 and we're gonna have lots of details on that to follow. Um, this campus is known as the birthplace of the Norbertine order of priests in the US. At the time of this of the current church building, when it was new in 1893, the bishop in Green Bay had um, written to the St. Norbert Abbey in Holland to request that they send missionary priests here to um, serve the many Catholic churches in the Belgian settlement. The leader of the first group of Norbertines um, to arrive included Father Bernard Pennings, who served this church for five years from 1894 until, um, or 1893 until 1898, when he moved to De Pere and laid the foundation for the Norbertine Abbey and St. Norbert College. The, moving ahead, the church was closed as a Catholic church in 2001 and the parish united with the St. Francis Parish in Brussels. It is now the campus of the Belgian Heritage Center and the home of the Peninsula Belgian American Club. Um, there are three collaborating organizations on this campus. The Belgian Heritage Center, of course, with our um, historical and cultural mission. Um, we are a 501c3 organization. The Peninsula Belgian American Club is a membership organization of Belgian American descendants, but of course anyone, anyone interested can join. Um, they are known for facilitating visits between Belgium and the US since the 1970s. They also offer a program schedule with a nice lineup for the upcoming season, and those will all be held in the Belgian Heritage Center. And then the other organization is the St. Francis and St. Mary Parish, which continues to maintain um, its historic cemetery, the St. Mary of the Snows Cemetery on the, on the campus. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Joe Alexander and he's gonna talk more about our project. Thank you, Ann. Um, just a, a quick disclaimer uh, in doing some of the research about the buildings and what I'll be talking about there's some conflicting dates and, and we're still doing research. So uh, some of the timelines were off a little bit, but uh, so hopefully we'll be able to take care of that under more research. Uh, that being said, um, the St. Mary's of the Snow School Convent um, circa 1900, which is the picture you're looking at, uh, was built in 1894. Uh, they used a recycled farmhouse, uh, purchased and moved into place from about a half a mile away. Uh, we're still trying to find out more 
about that recycled farmhouse, who owned it and where it was located. It was built under the direction of Reverend Abbott Bernard H. Pennings O'Preum, a Norbertine priest, priest who came from Holland in 1893 to minister to the needs of the Belgian community. <clears throat> it was used for the sisters to live in, live and teach in. The, uh, the Catholic parochial school was also called sister school. <clears throat> the picture of the schoolhouse uh, that you see is where it was first built, just northeast of the Belgian Heritage Center, towards the back of the parking lot. You are looking at the front of the building. I'd like to point out the bell tower uh, to the right side uh, in the picture. We're not sure when it was removed, uh, but hope to reconstruct one and put it back on the schoolhouse. The next slide, St. Mary's of the Snow School Convent, uh, as you see it today. Uh, this picture is where it is currently located. It's about 100 yards east of the Heritage Center. We're looking at the back of the schoolhouse, which is currently the main entrance. It has seven rooms. Uh, the lower level has a kitchen, dining room, sitting room, and a classroom. In the classroom behind the sliding doors is an altar, which was used to say mass every morning. Uh, three bedrooms upstairs. Currently, one is used for storage and display of artifacts. There are no running, there's no restrooms or running water. Uh, it does have current, uh, it has electricity. Uh, we're not sure when it was installed, but hopefully we'll, we'll figure that out. The next slide, the, uh, the school and convent history. Uh, Sisters of St. Francis of Holy Cross taught parochial school here until 1925. They also taught public school here for a few years. In the mid 1950s, it was rented out and used as a private residence. Uh, the Homer Willems family and uh, the Bud Math family. It was used for parish religious education in the early 1960s. Uh, now a little history about the Peninsula Belgian American Club, which was first organized in 1964. Uh, one thing uh, I'd like to mention an interesting tidbit uh, about the, the club. When it was first organized in 1964, one of the officers of that newly formed Belgian club was Leonard Lamper. He was the treasurer, and his daughter uh, is Sandy Orsted, uh, one of our presenters today, and she is the treasurer of the Belgian Heritage Center. So I'm sure her father would be very happy uh, to hear about that. <laughs> so thank you, Sandy. Uh, after a period of time, the club became inactive, and in 1968, they reorganized. Uh, their first year, they started with 12 to 20 members with the purpose of honoring their forefathers to salute their efforts and recreate that era of, in history when good fellowship was prime to promote social and charitable functions and to communicate and assist all incorporated Belgian clubs, which included Canada and Belgium. In the late 1960s, it was determined that the old schoolhouse had to be moved from the church property as the diocese no longer wanted it. It was purchased by the George Bodwin family and offered to the newly formed Peninsula Belgian American Club to hold meetings. It then moved about 50 yards to its current location. The Peninsula Belgian American Club at one point had, had over 400 members uh, many of the members would travel to Belgium and stay with Belgians. And some of those Belgians they stayed with were with, actually were distant relatives. Uh, this was reciprocated and the Belgians would travel to Wisconsin. Uh, since that first trip in 1972, these biannual exchange visits have continued and the Belgian club still exists and holds monthly meetings the third Thursday of the month throughout the summer. 
uh, which are held at the Belgian Heritage Center. Uh, presentations are given on a variety of subjects uh, relating to Belgian history. And there's a yearly membership fee of $20. Uh, our membership is not required to attend, but it is encouraged. And in 2019, the schoolhouse and property was transferred to the Belgian Heritage Center for historic restorations. Uh, as a 501c3 organization, it allows us more fundraising opportunities uh, with a goal of providing public access. Uh, we have hope to have it open uh, by the end of this month. The uh, next slide. The school convent restoration and restoration project vision. Uh, we'd like to restore the classroom, kitchen, and sister sitting room to 1900 condition. The classroom is very close to being finished. Uh, if you check out our Facebook, you can actually see some of the work that's being done. Um, incorporate period furnishings, decorations, artifacts, and art. Uh, the Heritage Center, along with the Belgian Club, have a small collection of period furnishings, uh, but we're still looking for things. Create an exhibit area to share the history of the building and stories of the people and organizations. Provide accessibility entry that does not detract from the historic building elements. Uh, restore historic exterior and reconstruct the bell tower. <clears throat> and next I would like to uh, pass it on to Sandy. Thank you, Joe. As you've heard from Joe and Anne, the St. Mary campus and the school convent have a, a long and interesting history. Belgian Heritage Center volunteers know a lot about our history and culture, but we're not preservation experts. So we knew we needed help to get our preservation efforts right. Our first step was to retain Hoffman planning, design and construction of Appleton to assess the buildings on campus and provide options for restoring portions of the campus to a historic period. Their assessment included a thorough inspection of all buildings and building systems, short-term maintenance recommendations, longer-term maintenance and improvement suggestions, and fortunately, no expensive emergency repairs and only a couple of more urgent concerns. The engagement with Hoffman was also to teach the Belgian Heritage Center's board and volunteers to be more knowledgeable about how to maintain our historic buildings. So they identified do's and don'ts of preservation, assisted with the development of written policies for the board to guide maintenance and improvements to ensure that all work is done with historic preservation in mind, and also explained how to balance preserving historic elements with financial constraints and today's visitor needs and expectations. Hoffman also produced a video explaining the treatment of each building element as a resource that we can use now and as a future um, at, in the future for future decisions. After that project was completed, which focused on the buildings themselves, it was decided to apply the same approach to board guidance for future exhibit development. So we're fundraising right now to retain a professional exhibit developer to assist with interpretive plans and policies throughout the campus. Slide, please. Our, our preservation policy defines in detail the interior and exterior spaces, the spaces to be preserved in their historic conditions and those that will not. As Anne explained, the, the St. Mary campus has great significance in the Moor, but the Belgian Heritage Center's mission is to tell the story of all the Belgian settlements, not just the one around our campus. So for this reason, the school and roadside chapel that you see in this photo are designated for historic restoration, but the church building is going to be treated differently. The exterior will be retained in a historic condition, but not the interior. It's not a worship space anymore. It's, it's um, now the center of efforts to share the history of the Belgian settlements. The, the spaces to be restored are going to be restored to a 1900 to 1910 time period, which was viewed as the height of the, the development of the Belgian settlements. The preservation plan also identifies the building construction details we need to keep in mind, um, in addition to the historic use of the spaces. So in our discussion today, we'll focus on a few building elements of the school that need to be addressed and the challenges they represent. Next slide, please. 
As mentioned previously, we have a detailed report from a professional engineer that was overall very good news about the condition of the school convent building. The windows all need replacement, but we knew that and started replacing them last year. Very few changes were actually made from 1925 when the building was in active use as a school. The Peninsula Belgian American Club, which we also call just the Belgian Club, retained most of the original characteristics of the building. That makes our restoration job today a lot easier. The Belgian Club also collected a number of antiques and artifacts that date back to the restoration period that we can use, as Joe mentioned. And although they replaced the, the student desks with seating for group meetings, as you see in that top picture there in the slide, they did keep the, the original desks in the attic. So we have them available to us now. The altar um, is behind sliding doors in the classroom. And when the, um, when the doors were closed for instruction, they provided extra blackboard space for the teachers. When mass was celebrated, the doors were open to reveal the altar. All of this is original and all of it is in great condition. The Belgian Club also maintained records and information that will give us a solid starting point for our historical research. But as Joe mentioned, there is often conflicting information and more research needs to be done uh, to complete our project. Next slide, please. This is a list of the exterior building elements to be preserved or considered in the restoration. And as you can see, they range from major building components like roofing and windows to smaller details like door and window hardware. Certain decisions that we'll have to make um, will need to balance what's historically accurate with what's important for providing access and a great visitor experience for everyone. In a few cases, we'll need to correct some of the things that were done over time. And in other cases, we have to address needs that were just not previously an issue. ADA accessibility is an, exa is an example of that. The previous use of the building was as a private club. Now that it's changed to a public use, we need to make the building accessible, and that is one of our top priorities. Next slide, please. Designing and building a ramp is not as easy as it might sound. There's a lot to consider to create a safe and convenient access ramp. And this sketch gives you an idea of the considerations just to design the ramp itself. So things like the slope, the turning area, traction, all of, all of that needs to be considered. Um, that's the exterior component of, of, the, of the ramp. But there's more than just an exterior consideration. In this case, we have to consider which entrance point will work the best, taking into consideration what happens once a visitor enters the, the building. They need to be able to maneuver comfortably, and their flow through the building needs to provide a nice visitor experience. And all of this needs to be accomplished in a way that doesn't detract from the historic elements of the building. For example, a ramp will need to incorporate handrails and balusters consistent with the historic period and be made of materials that fit with the building exterior. So hiring a qualified designer and builder is going to be necessary to achieve a safe and attractive solution to our accessibility challenge. Next slide, please. On the interior, um, we have a list here of the, the building elements that we need to consider. And again, there are trade-offs between perfect historic restoration and practicality. Fortunately, many of these features are in very good condition. Uh, the wood floors are, are a great example. They are in remarkable condition given their age. The stairs pictured here are another example of providing safe public access. In this case, the steps are not built to today's standards. Um, so they're a little uncomfortable to walk up and down. And this is going to make it difficult to provide access um, to the public on the second floor of the building. That's why our efforts now are concentrated on the first floor. We also have to be prepared to deal safely with lead paint, which we assume is present throughout the building and will add to the cost of any restoration. Next slide, please. We have several great photos of the exterior of the school, unfortunately not the interior. And so um, we do know that the first floor consists of four primary rooms. Um, as Joe talked about before, we're sure about the use of two, but need a little bit more research to be really convinced of the other two rooms. The original use of the building as a school convent ended in 1925. So firsthand knowledge is limited. Fortunately, there are some people who visited the building before too many changes were made, and there are sources of documentation that may help us. The organizations that occupied the building during its history have information, 
For example, the Sisters of St. Francis of the Holy Cross have records that of all the sisters who lived and taught at the school. We also know that the Norbertines have records, and there's a book containing read, uh, letters written by the early priests who served the district. All of those are great resources. Interestingly, though, what must have seemed the most obvious was not always written down, you know, such as the use of each space on the first floor. So some amount of detective work is going to be necessary to flush out some of those details. And certain records may not be found in the records. If information isn't available, period research should provide clues as to what was likely at the time. The photo that you see in this slide is an example. This is not a picture of our school, but it is representative of the period and provides clues about furniture, lighting, and heating that might have been used at the time. Next slide, please. Color is another interesting challenge. We, we don't know the original color of the exterior. We do know that it was changed. We were given several different ways to determine the original colors and where to look for different colors, such as the main body of the building versus the, the trim. One way is to hire a color analyzer to come in and figure this out for us. Another is to do it ourselves by trying to work through layers of paint um, using boiled linseed oil to try to find the original layer and its color. There are also historical records of the colors that would have been favored during different period, time periods that would provide clues of what would have been likely. In some ways, determining the actual color may not seem as important as some of the other historic elements, but color has a significant impact on how we perceive our surroundings. So capturing the correct color is important to recreating the spaces. Next slide, please. Another trade-off is the historical accuracy um, versus actually preserving his, the historic structure. And downspouts and gutters are an example of this. Gutters and downspouts are not historically accurate to the time period of our restoration in this type of building. But diverting water away from a wood building with a wooden foundation and an earthen crawl space is very important. So the challenge here is to provide those features um, that preserve the building, but to do it in a way that minimizes their aesthetic impact by blending them in with other features. The picture you see here is an existing condition and it's a good example of this. The gutter and the downspout are painted to, to match the trim color and the downspout is partially masked with some shrubbery. Now we'd like to turn things back over to Joe who will talk a little bit more about our long and short term plans and give you a sneak peek into our progress. All right, our uh, short-term and long-term plans. Of course, uh, we hope to open, like I mentioned earlier, uh, at the end of this month, and that'll help us in, uh, to aid in fundraising and community interest. Uh, recreate historical interior as best we can with what we have. Use available furnishings, artifacts, and fr framed family portraits. Volunteer created exhibits about building history and provide ADA access, uh, hopefully uh, before we open next year. And our interpretive plan for permanent restoration and future exhibits, of course, uh, something very important, uh, raise money, uh, research history, appearance, and develop interpretive plan, uh, and have professional exhibit development and historic preservation. So the, the next couple slides um, that you'll be seeing um, will give you an idea of, of what we're currently working on. Um, the classroom is uh, to the left is the way it was used for the Peninsula Belgian American Club. And then to the right is uh, the way we have it. Uh, we, the, some of the desks that we took down from the attic and uh, they cleaned and we kind of have it set up uh, pretty good. So you're getting a, a little idea there of, of what we're what we're doing in the classroom. And then the next is there. Yeah, there we go. Um, the next slide is you can see what one of the desks looked like that we took down from the attic, and uh, and what it looked like after. And I think Sandy could probably comment because she's one of the ones that was cleaning it. Uh, so you can get an idea. They they can really look good uh, with just. Uh, you know, some elbow grease, but uh, it looks really good. So, 
Uh, as far as that, that's all all I have. Unless Andy, uh, Sandy, or Ann, you have anything to uh, to mention on that? I'll just throw in that when we brought the desks down, they must have been in the attic for about a hundred years, <laughs> and. Um, there was a lot that accumulated on the desk. I'm not sure I want to know exactly what all of it was, but once we got to the bottom of it, we were very impressed with how those desks held up over time. Well, thank you. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask the question. Meanwhile, I have a few questions. Um, I found some old articles in the Door County newspaper um, archive, and um, it talks, they talk about the teachers. I think it was Sister Pauline was for the parochial school and Sister Claire for the public school. And then they mentioned originally, this is the old school before this one, um, a Miss Elise was going to teach French. And um, I'm wondering why she would teach French. <laughs> It also mentioned that the teachers did not speak Walloon. So I'm just curious about that. Does anyone have an idea? <laughs> well, I can give you some comments about the, about the sisters. We, we do know that the, um, we have a, a history of all the teachers who lived at the school um, and either taught in the parochial school there or as part of the public school system um, in those early days of the settlement. In fact, for a little while, the, the, the public school was actually hosted in a room attached to the church. Um, obviously some shared resources there. But I, I'm not sure why they would have taught French necessarily, but um, it, it was not unusual for the teachers not to speak Walloon. They were, they were not um, necessarily from the community. And we have a lot of interesting stories from some of our old timers talking about what happened when they showed up in school and they couldn't speak English and their teachers couldn't speak Walloon. So I don't know if French was a, um, a stopgap. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there, there were some French speakers in, um, in the group because French was the written language that they used for communication at that time. Yeah, that's interesting. I just, I just um, think that I did read that the teachers did not speak Walloon. So that must have been pretty difficult in the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the, the students were not allowed to speak Walloon. They, they would get in trouble if they spoke Walloon. So like Sandy said, there's some interesting stories here from some of the, uh, some of the people that we taped uh, on what would happen if they, if they were caught uh, speaking Walloon in, in the classroom. <laughs> Something that you would use to punish students today. <laughs> um. I also read, um, again, there's some really interesting articles in the old advocates. Um, John Kalert, is that his name? He was involved with local history and um, actually building the library. Um, in his article, he talks a lot about the earlier school that existed just before um, this one. They did, the school did burn down in the church also, right? Right. And um, right. then they were rebuilt in the church in 1893 and the school in 1894. But it's kind of charming to read how um, the, the nuns or the sisters came to the school and found uh, miscellaneous furniture, like handmade tables. Wouldn't you love to see some of those things? Uh -huh. And then they had beds with stuffed with cattails. I think that is kind of mm -hmm. interesting. I'd like to see what a bed stuffed with cattails <laughs> looks like. <laughs> but um, It'd be fun to see if you could set up a bedroom like that. They also, he also mentions a lot about how in the attic the, where they slept, they just had dividers of four feet tall and that sort of thing. I'm really wondering where he got all this information. Yeah. Are those in the papers that you have? I have seen a similar account to the sisters living in, in, the, in um, what, what you're talking about, where their rooms were, were separated with the divider. And that was, I think, in the old, the old building or the old rectory of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, some of that is in some records that were, were left by the priests that served there. I see. And do you have those records? We have some narratives. I mean, they're short, but I'm familiar with that, that particular story. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm just um, thinking if anyone wants to help with research, where could they go? Do you have a library there at the Belgian Heritage Center or um, what, what sort of organization do you have for doing research? We, well, we have a genealogist, uh, you know, that's a volunteer genealogist. And we do have some records here at the Belgian Heritage Center. Uh, you know, if people are looking to try and find family, um, you know, or any type of genealogy uh, work there, they're more than welcome to come here and look, uh, or we can put them in touch for, with our, you know, volunteer genealogist. She's, she's pretty up on, on all that. So, mm -hmm. and we have some information here of websites that, that they could go to to get information. So. So we do have some stuff here. Uh, people are, uh, want to come and do some research on their families. There are a number of um, academic papers that have been written over time by different doctoral uh, uh, candidates investigating different aspects of the Belgian settlements of the Walloon language, of um, some of the history and traditions. There's, there's an amazing amount of work actually on the community. I think sometimes our challenge is, is going to be sorting through all of that to find exactly what we're looking for. And one of the nice things about the uh, religious organizations that are attached to the, to the campus is that they, they as a, just as a matter of practice, keep very detailed records about the activities of their communities. So we know that they will also be a good resource. Um, another great resource is the uh, UWGB archives. They have a Belgian collection that has a lot of, um, there are oral histories, recorded oral histories, there are photos, there are uh, surveys of uh, all the different buildings in the area. So there's, there's a lot of information that's out there. The trick is bringing it all together, um, doing it in a way that's, that's you know, appropriate and historically vetted uh, to make sure that we're, we're telling the right story in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And that's really what our challenge is now is um, trying to put all of that together in a way that's appealing to our visitors. Um, I know that a lot of that uh, collection you mentioned at UWGB is online, including the interviews. Has anyone gone through all those interviews to see if they mentioned the school? Anyone mentioned? Those were made quite a while ago, like the 70s, weren't they? We've been through a number of those videos. In fact, we use those as a resource for the exhibits that are already at campus. And I did just recently go through those to look for clues about, um, about the school and didn't find anything in the, um, in the summaries of the videos. There, there are a, a number of hours, uh, so it would take a long time to go through all of them to find out for sure. Yeah. But there, there is bound to be information there um, about most of what we're looking for. Yeah, and um, you would wonder if anyone has photographs um, you mentioned you don't have photographs of the inside of the school. Mm -hmm. we, we strongly encourage any, anyone who visits the, the campus to bring with them any historic photos they might have. We'll scan them right away uh, so you can leave with your photo. But that's been a, a really helpful source of information as well. Um, and, and especially if you can bring the story along with the photo and some of the identifying information, that is a goldmine. It helps us with our research. And it's also a great thing for us to be able to share with other people who are interested in having that information, especially family information. Yeah. I know the one article that I have here from the old advocate in uh, 1971 written by Keta Steves shows a picture of two gentlemen who were fixing up the school at that time when it was taken over by I think the heritage um, group. And the names there, and I, I'm fascinated by the names, Des Desire, I talked, I asked Anne about this, and apparently there's a nickname for Desire, but that's a kind of common Belgian name, isn't it, for a gentleman? And his last name was Jaron Dole, Jaron Dole. So- that's, um, that's my grandfather. Yeah, that's great. Do you Ziri, have the- Ziri Gerondel. So you would, how you would call it, what would you call him again? Ziri? Ziri. Ziri. Desire. Yeah, it was like Desire and then Ziri Gerondale. He lived right across the road, actually, where my mother was raised, right across the road from the school homes, almost. So, yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm not aware of that picture. I mean, that, but yeah, that's, that would be uh, really, really interesting to see and read about. Yeah, and the other gentleman was John Trudoir, and they were in the school in uh, 1911 and 1914. So that's slightly after what you're aiming for, isn't it? 
about the time. Yeah, yeah actually, my, my mother knew there's actually, I think the first picture might have my grandpa in, in it um, of the mm -hmm. old schoolhouse from the early 1900s. But yeah, I did know that he went to, he went to, to, you know, to school there in the early 1900s when it was open, grandpa. So. Yeah, and, um, this was just uh, elementary school, wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. What grades did they cover? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can answer, uh, answer that, Sandy. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, uh, yeah, it would be middle or, or uh, elementary. I was thinking through eighth grade, but I'm not positive yeah, on that. But. Um, also, just a comment on the picture that you're talking about. It, um, it, coincidentally, I was given a, bo a box of snapshots from one of our volunteers, and I was going through the pictures and was, I noticed on the backside, it mentioned uh, one of my relatives saying that it, this person is the boy wearing a hat. Unfortunately, when you flip the picture over, you see about five boys wearing hats. So I'm still not really no. sure be, but um, at least it's a, it's a, you know, it's a start. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really, really fun when you are really involved with it directly like that, I can imagine. Yeah, and, and you know, my mother just mentioned recently too, she was talking about the, the schoolhouse and the big room upstairs was a boarding school. So some of the kids would stay there uh, temporarily. So it was all beds up there. And I think she said when originally when they started cleaning it out, the beds up there, they pulled straw, you know, when they had to throw the beds out, but they were made of straw. And, you know, I mean, this was probably a few years back, but, uh, you know, she remembers hearing about and seeing some of that stuff. So it's, uh, you know, that's that's important if we can still get some information from some of the the, the uh, older people here uh, to tell some of these stories because they might they still might know it yet. Well, you know, the li uh, I'll throw out um, this idea: the library has um, oral history kits that can be checked out of the library. Mm -hmm. So you might want to get those. They're really nice quality speakers, and they're all set up to do just oral histories. So yeah. get that down before it, it gets any later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, does anyone in the audience have any questions? And if anyone wants to volunteer, who would they contact? Just the, the go to the website? Yeah, you, yep, you can visit our website. Um, all the information is on belgianheritagecenter.org. Um, and we're always looking for assistance, either uh, you know if they can if they know where we can find information about the schoolhouse, or if they're willing to volunteer. Uh, yeah, check out our website. There's you can contact us via the website, and uh, we we can always use some help, either be to research or volunteer. And you said you're opening at the uh, very soon, actually, right? Um, the end of the year. Yep. Yep. We're going to open May 28th. Um, and we should be open through throughout the summer till the end of October, hey. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for- uh, Excuse me, there is a question up. Okay, sorry, I missed it. Um, you talk, the question is, you talk primarily about Walloon. My mother's side is Walloon, but my dad's side is Flemish. Are you interested in Flemish Belgian history? Absolutely, we are. And as a matter of fact, one of the projects that got put on hold uh, last year because of COVID was exactly this. It was to do a little bit more research about the Flemish community specifically, um, which was which did not end up being quite as concentrated as, as the Walloon communities, but we are very interested in, in Flemish history as well as the, the Walloon story. And so again, if you've got information, we actually struggle a little bit on the Walloon side to, or on the Flemish side to find as much information as we have about Walloon. So we'd love to have it. I know there's a book in the library um, in the Lori History Room on the Flemish families in, I believe around Brown County. Of course, some of that may include um, Kiwani and Door County. Mm -hmm. You know that, do you have that book with the names? I believe that's the Rentmeester book. Um, and we do have that. That's been one of our resources. Yes, great. Well, if are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, I look forward to coming and seeing the schoolhouse this uh, summer. And thank you for letting us know. I know it's a lot of work. Good luck with, uh, um, with getting it into shape.
it's really exciting. And it's a real addition to the um, no more historic district. Yes, thank you very much for having us. Thank, thank you. you.